What is Nintendo's strategy in 2024? Are they just mindlessly churning out games to mark time until the new system comes blasting over the horizon line, or is there actually a method in their madness as they enter the Switch's eighth full year? I think in fact there is a rationale to the kind of games we're seeing this year, and unravelling that might make us better able to forecast Nintendo's moves going forward. So settle in and let's answer the question, what are the six trends that show Nintendo's 2024 game plan. Before we begin, let's consider the current status quo of the Switch. Evidently, it is an aging console, although it may be some way off its twilight years, given the huge install base that will probably keep it on the scene long after the keenest gamers have moved on to the sequel system. A new Nintendo console has several priorities, including the Megaton franchises being established and all the other games which they hope will become Evergreen. Even last year, the likes of Tears of the Kingdom and Super Mario Bros. Wonder scooped huge sales numbers, but one was a sequel and the other a successor to a game series that has already had previous outings on the system, albeit in the form of the new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe port and the Super Mario Maker 2 spin-off title. Just going for big sales is not going to be enough. They need to think who they are selling to, and perhaps as importantly for a company as strategic as Nintendo, who will they be able to continue to sell to even after the Switch hardware is superseded? And I think that is guiding the kind of games they're creating for 2024. Also, it would be naive to disregard the fact that the majority of game scheduling doesn't come from high-level conceptions of elaborate 3D chess games by Furukawa-san and the board, but comes down to other factors. For example, a new Paper Mario probably dropped this year largely because it took that amount of time, give or take, for them to create this title after they were done with the last one. In fact, I think they probably could have expedited the Thousand Year Door if they really wanted to, as my previous research into the development staff behind the Intelligent Systems games proves that there is a very strong overlap between the Paper Mario team and the WarioWare team, and with two separate WarioWare entries over the last couple of years, it's certainly possible that the next Paper Mario could have been given a higher priority status. Still, the vagaries of video game development and the need to balance budgets and allocate resources is always going to take precedence over Blue Sky Wargaming of which games would work best to which points. They need a steady cadence of games. They have a limited number of resources and franchises, and to a certain extent, they need to cut their cloth according. However, these are the six trends that I think I can identify in recent games that are revealing about where they're looking to position the Nintendo Switch system at this point in its life cycle. Trend one, appeal to children and entry level players. Look at the structure of Echoes of Wisdom as set out in its very latest trailer. It is clear that structurally and in terms of the menu layouts and approach to quests, it is very close in spirit to Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Now that's not a huge surprise, this is the first original Zelda they've created since those games launched, and naturally they would recycle some of those aesthetics as it suits the newer title. But it also means that anybody who enjoys 2D Zelda, and you have to think this would include a number of younger players who would have been bought the game because of its toy capsule look and slightly simpler, more accessible structure are going to be ideally placed to graduate to the 3D titles in the years ahead. If they can position Echoes of Wisdom as the entry-level Zelda game on the entry-level Switch-like console, then they could easily bring a lot of new future players on board. Add in other examples of this, like Princess Peach Showtime, the shorter and more mission-focused Luigi's Mansion 2 HD, and let's face it, in the months to come there has to be a 90% shout we're going to get a new Kirby title. Let's say a 90% shout for a Kirby title within the next 12 months ending the end of August 2025. Add all these together and we're getting quite a few games which target new players. It's a great pitch for once the new system is in place if they can have a deep bench of games that are going to turn children onto Nintendo products. Trend 2, an increase in visual novels and narrative-heavy stories. The most obvious examples of this are the two visual novel games released this calendar year, Another Code Recollection and the upcoming Famicom Detective Club, Emmy of the Smiling Man. However, add to this the story-heavy Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door and 
Mario & Luigi Brothership, plus last year's Super Mario RPG and Detective Pikachu Returns, which is basically another visual novel, and you have a robust lineup of narrative-driven games. So what is the strategy? Early on, Nintendo drove engagement by simply having games that people would return to time and time again. Breath of the Wild, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Splatoon, and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate are all titles that people will pour tens and often hundreds of hours into over the course of years. By contrast, these narrative titles are not likely to have that innate pull, but by having more story content, they can stem the flow of people putting aside their Nintendo Switches. As long as people are picking up their consoles and playing on at least a fairly regular basis, Nintendo know they have an active and engaged base. It's when people break that habit and discover Netflix or music or God forbid the great outdoors that they're sweating it. So no, their games may not be the most visually appealing at this point in time. They might not be the most action-packed or groundbreaking, but one tactic they are employing in their releases is to have more smaller scale but narrative-heavy titles. These titles are just never going to be as expensive to produce as many other titles. It takes a handful of people a long time to make a great story, but the majority of the gameplay involves reading text, and so the graphical complexity is generally less, which isn't to say these games don't look great as well. Playing Switch is habit-forming, and also people are often minded to discuss stories, which gives them a hype factor. The MEO trailer of the sinister-looking smiling man shorn of any context at all, was so different from what Nintendo usually try, precisely because it was an approach best to suit that story, to the intrigue people would feel, and to try to bring people in to the narrative experience. You don't necessarily want narrative games dominating media conversations when you've got a new console with jazzy graphics. You want video of people doing amazing things and being wowed. But right now, story is a really good special effect and a cheap way to get a lot of attention on social media and that is of value to Nintendo at this point in their console life cycle. Trend 3. Appeal to women and girls. We've noticed this most obviously with the Princess Peach Showtime game and the eponymous heroine of the Zelda franchise finally taking the lead in Zelda Echoes of Wisdom. But I think it goes a little deeper than that particularly with another code in Famicom Detective Club, there's something else that interests me. You see, with traditional novels, women tend to read the vast majority of books sold, and while detective stories have sometimes been perceived as having a more male appeal, women do consume a lot of crime fiction. I can find no specific data on the readership of visual novels, but Quantic Foundry did some general research on primary play motivations in 2016 and found that women were 50% more likely to identify a strong story as a good reason to play, although I'm not really sure of the quality of that data. In that sense, I wonder if another code and Famicom Detective Club are actually part of the same strategy as Princess Peach Showtime and making Zelda herself a lead character in her own right in Legends of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom, i.e. to knock down the stereotypes of Switch games catering to male players primarily and show a greater range of titles that might appeal to girls and to women. Think about it, the first wave of the Switch gets in core gamers, then they expand to their usual target range, and particularly boys and young men. Animal Crossing, Switch Sports and others start rolling out their appeal to girls, more young women, and to casual gamers. Now they need to broaden that appeal still further, with a particular focus on younger girls and women who are not brought in by the likes of Animal Crossing. The very people who are slightly less likely to be early adopters of technology but do enjoy collecting and narrative titles. This incidentally is another reason for Endless Ocean Luminous to come out this year, although sadly it seems the reviews weren't that good. Will this work in terms of bringing in female players? I will be very interested to see if Nintendo release any data on this going forward, as currently it's a bit of a mystery, but it must be something that they can track since the Nintendo Switch records an awful lot of information. My hunch is that the success or failure of many 2024 games, specifically with a female demographic, is something they will be studying very closely. Trend 4. Mario. Yes, this is a huge year for Mario games and related spin-offs. Not a huge surprise, you may say, in the wake of the Mario movie. Also, the Switch is now the repository for new entries in both the console and handheld Nintendo games catalogs, and since both of these featured a heavy dose of Mario separately, it is no surprise that the Switch having both franchises is driving even more Mario goodness onto the console. 
Still, with Mario vs. Donkey Kong, Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, Super Mario Party Jamboree, and Mario & Luigi Brothership, this year has an unprecedented four retail Mario titles. And then you have to add Princess Peach Showtime and Luigi's Mansion 2 HD on top to make six. That's nearly half the titles Nintendo are releasing this year. Why is this? I speculate that it's part of a move towards appealing to younger fans as the Switch winds down its life cycle and moves to being the cheaper, more accessible side console. 2017's 3DS lineup also boasted four Mario retail titles, the only year it did so. Early on in a console's life, you know that Mario will sell, but you also want a diversity of games being offered. But now, people have a wealth of games to choose from, so they can retrench to those ever-reliable sellers. It's a rare franchise where they can keep pumping out games without worrying about cannibalizing their sales, but the Mario franchise is certainly one of them. And because many of these titles are on the smaller end of the Mario game size spectrum, they're often replacing previous titles on the system. Paper Mario the Origami King appeared to have gone out of print in North America, and so it was a good time for Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door to replace it. Mario Party has had two previous entries, but they have sold very well, so adding Jamboree to the mix should appeal to a lot of people who enjoyed the past two games. And then there are franchises like Mario vs Donkey Kong and Mario & Luigi, which haven't had a Switch outing until now at all. Basically, if in doubt, trust in Mario. Trend 5. Mega Multiplayer Early Switch games prioritised primarily online play and couch co-op option. 1-2 Switch was explicitly modelled around 1-2 players, while Mario Kart 8 Deluxe did push the idea of up to 4 players, but it was normally the exception among the Switch lineup. However, Everybody 1-2 Switch and now Super Mario Party Jamboree are explicitly focused on the idea of getting a large number of people playing. The words everyone and Jamboree explicitly focus on the concept that these games are for very, very large groups. This is the kind of title that Nintendo simply couldn't do on any prior system. The Switch is the first of its kind to have both the online connectivity and the massive install base to make such a bold assertion as requiring a massive party of people to play. They are supporting this push from a hardware perspective with the recent dock for Joy-Con to ensure Joy-Con are charged and they have had Nintendo systems working on technology utilized particularly in Everybody 1-2 Switch so that people can join in using mobile phones if they don't happen to be in the Nintendo ecosystem themselves. Again, this is a smart way to ensure that even as the Switch winds down, people are still connected with Nintendo and their content. A game like Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door may involve one person playing for, say, 30 hours. However, if they can get 10 people playing Super Mario Party Jamboree for 3 hours, they have not just had the same level of engagement outright, but they have actually brought awareness of their content to a lot more people. Nintendo World Championship's NES edition is a similar kind of idea. By emphasising this is a World Championship, they're really building on that idea of community and competition and I would expect to see more similar types of games dripping out over the next year to come. Trend 6. Raid the Archives This has been obvious for quite a while now, but Nintendo are not shy about dipping into their classic games. To be fair, the Switch has always supported itself to a significant degree by the use of ports and remasters. From February 2018 to January 2019, check out the list of remakes and ports on the system, Bayonetta 1 and 2, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition, Donkey Kong Country, Tropical Freeze, Captain Toad, Treasure Tracker, The World Ends With You, and New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. And that's not counting Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which, while a much more expansive project, was essentially a remake of Pokemon Yellow. But the difference now is they're not trawling the Wii U for low-hanging fruit to build up their game's library. These games have always been part of the plan for Switch and their diverse titles from across Nintendo's historic game catalogue. We've had titles that remake or reuse game content from Famicom in Nintendo World Championships, from the Super NES in Super Mario RPG, from the GameCube in the form of Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, from the DS and Wii in another code recollection, and from the 3DS in the form of Luigi's Mansion 2 HD. And that's all in the past year. While the 2018 strategy frustrated Wii U fans who ended up with a library that was a greatest hits of the prior few years, Nintendo have spread their net wide now and have been 
relatively strategic about the kind of games and systems they're tapping into, getting a good balance of tickling the nostalgia bone of long-term players and bringing new gamers into the fold for some of these classic but underrated franchises. Time was, I'm not sure many gamers would have been aware of whether these games are remakes or not, but in the age of the internet, it's very easy for people to realise how these titles fall into a long tradition of previous games. And I think that sense of there being a legacy, even for people who don't remember the original era, is important. After all, there's no logical reason to advertise Nintendo World Championships as the NES edition on its own merits. Vast swathes of their core audience weren't even born when the NES was discontinued, and the original Famicom is older than the average age of most major countries. But Nintendo doesn't just want people to play their games, they also want to establish their games as a kind of family tradition, a legacy, almost an inheritance. Like Disney's once famous Vault, they're not shy about saying they will trot out titles and then hide them away again for the next generation and their advertising often explicitly references nostalgia. They can't get away with saying the Switch is the cool new thing on the block, it clearly isn't anymore, but making it a cherished gateway into Nintendo's gaming ecosystem is a smart pivot for a late in life console. Of course, once the Switch successor comes onto the scene, we're going to be looking at a different approach. New evergreens, graphical showcase titles, third party support and more will all become the name of the game but I will look into the likely future releases in another video. Before that day comes, please do check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel, check out these other lovely videos on screen for more, and in the meantime, have a terrific day, and I will see you next time for another Nintendo Forecast.